I'm John Townsend, and this is our Wednesday. Once a week Wednesday, we have a, I guess you call live stream or webinar, where we're on live, and we basically talk about helping people solve challenges and problems in the relational world, the personal world, um, um, families, um, business leadership, um, kind of the, the struggles that people go through pre-COVID, in, mid-COVID, after COVID, because life um, can have its challenges. And so we're on here for an hour at um, two o'clock Pacific time to three o'clock. And it's a pretty simple operation. Um, you just um, get on the phone with us and um, ask your question. You're not seen, you're heard. You don't have to worry about whether or not you got your makeup on or whatever, and but to see me. And we have a conversation about whatever the challenge is. And I, we, what we try to do is make an answer that makes sense that's really practical, but it also kind of goes under the hood and goes into the why these things occur in the first place to give you some kind of a deeper answer for things. And uh, we have a great community of people that support each other and we're all over all the live um, video um, aspects, YouTube Live, Twitter Live, LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live. And so we're kind of all over the place and, and people are very, very supportive. So. To get things started, um, I want to introduce our wonderful producer, Stacy. And Stacy, I always forget to tell them some home, some housekeeping. So come on and tell us. Absolutely. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Dr. Townsend Live Show today. We are so glad that you're here with us for this hour. And we see that people are already entering the waiting room, so we'll get right to it. If you are viewing this via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, any one of his um, platforms, you can call us at 1-877-853-5257. Again, that number is 1-877-853-5257. When you call the number, you'll need a meeting ID code to enter the waiting room. That ID code is 876-5437-2012. Again, 876-5437-2012. When you enter the waiting room on this platform, go ahead and turn your video camera off if you are on your iPhone or your laptop, um, desktop computer, just for privacy purposes. Uh, we want you to be able to talk with John, but we don't want to show everyone's faces out on the internet. So without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. Thanks for being with us today, everybody. Yep. And so thank you, Stacy. So Stacy is now engaging with whoever's on there. And um, some of you will be calling. Some of you will just be texting a question. We certainly prefer the calling because it feels, I don't know, more intimate and warm and personal. But, you know, if, if you're in a at work and you can't talk to somebody, but you can, you know, text, do that too. So we've got somebody up, looks like right now, Stacy. Absolutely. Uh, hello. Caller, caller, you are live on the Dr. Townsend Live Show. Go ahead and tell us your first name and where you're calling us from. Okay, my first name is Patty. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'm calling from uh, Yorba Linda. And uh, rather than a question, I have um, followed the works of Dr. Townsend and actually Dr. Cloud as well for years. And I am so great. I just want to take the opportunity to thank you, Dr. Townsend for all the amazing work that you have done uh, for the body of Christ and for people anywhere and everywhere. <clears throat> you know, your books from uh, Hiding from Love, mm. Boundaries, People Fuel, Entitlement Cure, <laughs> um, How People Grow. I, I've, I've recommended your book, How People Grow, to a number of people myself, and I've told them, here's, here's the primer on how to do life. So I just want to thank you. Patty, thank you, and 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 thanks also <laughs> for being a person who um, is really really intentional about growth and wants to do it, and is willing to read books and listen to shows and that sort of thing. And thank you also for um, influencing your friends. It feels to me like you're making a difference in the world. So I appreciate talking to a fellow grower, and I'm glad things are working well for you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, and. Um... I just received your pu pu I'm sorry, people fuel. Where is it fuel people? I don't know. Uh, Whichever people, one. <laughs> people fuel. It, it is it is so good. And it it is it, just an amazing review of all that's really important in when we deal with other people. So thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Thompson. Patty. You just um okay. kind of made my day. So God bless you. Thank you for calling. Oh good. God bless you. Okay. All right. Bye. Take care. Um, it's so cool when um, 
people are helped by material and that's great that's kind of the whole thing but also when they you know share with their friends like this is making a difference to me i mean it's sort of like why did you pick that movie probably because a friend said it was good why'd you pick that restaurant so I'm, I'm really happy to hear that and happy that she's influencing other people so looks like john's up now right stacy yep that's right welcome to the show john go ahead and tell us where you are from today John, are you with us? I think he's with us. He's connected. Oh, he's muted. Let's let's go ahead and unmute yourself, and then you'll be able to chat with Dr. Townsend. <laughs> okay, maybe. You know, I had this awful feeling, John, like you're frantically trying to push the right button, and something's not happening, and you're frustrated, and. I get it. So if we can't get you, come back and we'll fix it. Yeah, give us a shout back and um, we will go ahead and get you on when you call us back. But just be sure you have your mute um, off so that we can hear you. <laughs> All right. So, John, if you would like to, while I'm speaking with the next person, um, you can go ahead and talk about um, our e-blast that went out today, which I know a lot of people had some feedback on on your medias about being able to create a growth environment for themselves for 2023. A absolutely. Um, well, if you read that, whether or not you saw that video we sent out, um, the concept is everybody wants to change. Everybody wants to improve. You know, you want to, what do they say, lose your COVID-30, right? <laughs> you want to you know, getting a better job or a better marriage, better dating relationships or, or whatever. Improvements, I've never talked to, well, okay, I've, I've talked to maybe a few people in all these years who don't want to improve, but they're hopeless. <laughs> but the people that do want to improve, there's two kind of two categories. It's those who, they kind of get excited about it and they hope it gets better, but there's no plan. They just don't think about the structure of it. And so they read a book here and there or have a conversation, whatever, but you know, the, the next year is sort of like, I got the same screwed up problems I had last year. Why did <laughs> that's because there's that second group that goes, I really want to improve, you know, personally and professionally and in my, how I feel in my relationships. And I need a structure. The way that God designed things, the way that the neuroscience affirms what the Bible says is that there's got to be information. You need information. There's got to be relational support and there's got to be some kind of structure. Remember, you know, when you when if you're reading my books, um, I like to talk about the three elements of grace, truth, and time: relationship, information, or data, feedback, and the process. Well, you got to have the support because you can't do these hard things like find a new job, fix the relationship without people behind you on your side. But you also can't do it without information. That's why we read books. I, well, we record podcasts. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we get feedback from friends. That's the data. That's the facts. But the structure is the time process. What is the plan? And that just doesn't mean, you don't have to become some sort of anal retentive robot who's got every second structure in my life. That would drive me nuts. But you do have, have to have sort of a path. And that's why I, I said that on the on the, out, on the uh, e blast is what's your plan? It doesn't have to be this huge plan, but there's got to be a sense of, I'm, I want to accomplish X. I, I'm really big on stretch goals with my clients. What's your year goal? That's a stretch, right? what I want to accomplish in my personal life, professional life. And then what are the, what are the resources I have to have and write them down on a piece of paper or, or a whiteboard. And then once I've got the resources and I've got the plan, then I've got to get the support team, two or three people. And then, and then, and then what do I need to know? And what are the steps? Now, if you go, I'm just so unstructured. I am so right brain. I'm spontaneous. Get a friend who's a little on the obsessive side and said, I don't do structure and planning well, and they'll be glad to help you. But that's how people go. Hey, here it is now, early 2024, a year later after we're having this broadcast today, and I feel so much better. I accomplished these things in my relationships and in my emotional life, my personal life, my job, because I had a plan that worked. So get the plan together. If you're not a planner, get a planner. You can plan. All right. So somebody's okay. back. Is that all right? John yeah. is, is John like back. Yeah, it looks like we've got John back. John, welcome to the show. Go ahead and tell us where you're calling from and you're connected with Dr. Townsend. Hopefully you can hear me this time. I'm from uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. I hear you fine and thank you, John. Um, bear with me. I'm at work as a firefighter and I believe I might be getting a call. 
Well, thanks for what you do, and I Thank let let us I'm know. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. I've got, I've got a house fire, so. John, I hope you're safe, and I hope things go well there, and call us back. Thanks for what you do. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Man, do I appreciate those first responders. Um, so glad we've got them on our team. So I hope that goes well. Um, so while Stacy's talking to whoever she's talking to, um, the thing to remember is think about it like the last time you, I don't know, plan to decorate your house or plan to look at your child's future. You don't have to be sort of this uber spreadsheety kind of spreadsheety kind of person, but you do, but, but don't go off half cocked. Don't start getting excited about it. That's what we would call impulsivity. Before you do it, and this is kind of why December is a good time to do this, is what do I want, what's the desire, and make it something that is a, a stretch goal means something you can't do now, and it's gonna take some effort because what's worth it if you, there's no effort involved and no time involved. That's why, you know, I get really inspired by a lot of those weight loss ads and testimonials because I'll see the before and after picture and I kind of know what people have to do because, I, you know, I work with people on this. And when you see the picture of the person at, at, at weight one and then a year later, how they lost oodles of pounds. And I think that was not overnight. And that person, I know what they did. They said no to some things and there were some activities they said no to and some people they said no to so they could carve out time i know they had it and i know they had people on their side i know that they studied and found out about nutrition exercise and I, I know that they had to be patient because you can't lose weight really quickly i know what it went through what they went through and i've got so much respect for those ads and those people in those ads the people that do that it's the same thing whether it's your new job your new business your new education your new feelings about yourself um, you've got to be so patient with yourself and, and be nice to yourself and kind of basically um, be your advocate, but never, 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 never do it alone. Okay. I see somebody up. That's right. Um, caller, you are live with uh, Dr. Townsend. Go ahead and tell us your first name and where you're calling us from. Hi, my name is Sarah and I'm calling from Florida. Hi, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much for um, taking my call. <laughs> sure. What's your um, What's your question I, today? I don't know. I don't really know how to put the question out, but I'll tell you. I guess I'll tell you um, a little bit about it. Um, I'm a mom. I have two kids. I'm married. I'm a law school. I'm in my second year of law school, and I serve at my church. And sometimes... I feel like um, doing the best I can in this season. You know, I have a toddler, she's two, and I feel like I'm having a hard time keeping everything together. But then I kind of feel like I'm not enough. Like, um, my grades, I wish I had better grades in school right now. I do work part-time as well. But, like... I, I feel like, I guess my question would be like, how do you reality check your expectations where you know that maybe you're in a season where you just have to um, say no to a few things and just wait until you have more time? Like, do, do, do you understand? <laughs> am, I, am I speaking clearly enough or am I just like... <laughs> I'm not sure, Hello? honestly, um, Sarah. L let me let me say back what I think you're saying, and you can go. Oh no, you don't understand what I'm saying. We'll try it again, or maybe you go. Yeah, that's my question. You ready? Yes. You are I'm really ready. busy. Okay, you're really busy with a lot of activities, kind of overwhelmed, and the what we would call in my world, the outcomes or the fruit is not what you'd like it to be. Um, the grades aren't what you are capable of and you feel bad about that. And yet you're stretched very thin with work, church, school, mom, uh, wife, and all that. Um, and so your question, I think, is how do I, how do I prioritize? 
to get the things done that are yeah. most important? Does that is that the question, Sarah? Yes, yes, that's the question. All right. A lot of this has to do with like you kind of picked up that there's going to be have to be some no. I mean, <clears throat> there's an old saying, Sarah, you can't t put 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag. And you can't put 10 pounds of of thing. You can't put 10 hours of things to do in a five hour day. So you don't have enough time to do all this. So if you were going to cut out. Is, are there some things that I would call kind of starchy? They're nice things to do, but they're not necessary. Does anything come to mind that um, you go, it's nice, but it's not essential? And you can't say sleep because that's essential. But what else? <laughs> what else? What else can you either farm out to somebody else? I'll give you three categories. What kind of farm out to somebody else? What can I do that's kind of I may, maybe too much Netflix or maybe too much social media time that I can prune. That's the pruning part. There's the there's the there's the farm it out part, and there's the pruning part. And then other is maybe I need to make not not A's all the time because this is I can't prune back, and I need to say my expectations. I won't make A's all the time, but I'll make some B's. So think of those three categories and talk to me. So on the pruning. I don't watch TV. <laughs> the only TV I watch is with my kids. So I'm not on social, like, on, I have I have a limit on social media. So yeah. I know that I only go, like, five minutes at the most, and I never, I don't usually use it. Like, I use it when okay. I'm off school. So I know those things. Okay, so we're um, checking there, and we're checking there. This sounds good so far. Um, other than that, I mean, um, I spend time with family and I have tried to cut back on my work hours because, um, you know, my husband is supporting me. So he, you know, he's like, if you need to take off, you know, more work hours. So I only go, um, a few hours when, during, when I have like, when I have it, when I'm in the semester in school, then I, <clears throat> I don't go as much. And then when I have a break, then I try to go more. So I would say, I mean, the only thing I do other than that and studying and reading is, um, I mean, I spend time with my family, with a, a few friends that I have, and I serve at my local church. And I do that like once a month. Um, so I don't know if, I don't know what else, like, I don't know what else <laughs> I'm doing with my time. You know, this sounds like a lot of good, important stuff, Sarah. So let's go back to let's go back to the expectation you started the call with. Is there some uh -huh. reason you? I mean, what's your GPA? Right now, I had like my first year. Right now, it's two point five. My first year, I took a very big hit because I had my kids at home um, during COVID, and I I was on academic probation. I was working okay. more time, so that's what I did. I, I cut back on working. My my kids, one of my kids went back to school, and the other one started daycare. So that was that took like. But yeah, that, I don't think you can get. Out, I don't think I don't think you can graduate from law school with a two five, right? You've got to have at least a three .0. Is that is that correct? No, I can graduate with two five with two five. Oh, okay. If you got if you get your law degree with a two point five, what do you think? I think I want to have at least a three. I feel like that's gonna be an issue for me, like to get the kind of job that I want to get. So I guess that's whoa, whoa, where my whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Are, are you saying that when people now I don't know I've got a lot of lawyer friends but I don't know this answer you know this better than I do when you're when you submit your resume and you went to, went to a good school and the great references and all this do they say oh your GPA is important to us or no? Some people some people do I I, went, I actually went to an interview where they asked me about my GPA and you know it was like a big thing and a lot of jobs. Oh do that not all of the jobs do that and i have great references like i have really good references. hey, hey sarah sarah yeah I, I got a lot of friends who are, who are physicians and there's an old joke with physicians do you know what they call 
the person who graduates at the bottom of her class in med school, the person who graduates at the very bottom of her class and her, her, her class in med school. Do you know what they call her? What do they call her? They call her doctor. <laughs> of course, of course. And they yes, would yes. call Sarah, uh, whatever you call yourself, DJ or JD. That you know. In other words, I didn't know there's a big deal for TPS. Maybe it's that competitive. But here's the thing. When you have to think in terms of priorities, I, I think you've kind of done a lot of good work. I would probably do, number one, I'd ask your husband, I got to get to a 3-0 because it's the job that I need to get. Can we, can, can I work less? And if your husband, what would he say if you said that? I need to work even less. I'll, I'll do the church thing once a month. I'll take care of the kids and make sure they're good. I'll study. I'll be a great wife to you. Can I stop working? Would he say, no, we can't pay the bills? Or what would he say? I think he'll say go for it. Have we solved the problem? <laughs> yes. You know, sometimes it just helps to kind of put it all out there in some kind of a, a objective way. But if he says, yeah, we'll, you know, we're not going to go broke. It'll be a little bit thin. Maybe our vacation wouldn't be as nice or, or wait till later to buy cars. But I love you and I support you. I would take him up on that and I would say, Thank you so much for being my partner in life and thanks for my dream. And I would go for it. Sounds good. That sounds good. Thank you so much for your help. Well, it was a good problem to talk about. You take care, sir. <laughs> Thank you too. You know, sometimes there are those really on this show, we'll have those like deeper kind of complicated sort of family of origin-ish things and, and things about anxiety and depression. And sometimes it's sort of like, you know, I'm so busy. This is like Sarah's situation. Great person. I love everything she's trying to do. And we're so busy that we we're, it's kind of like uh, it's all crashing on us at the same time. It's very overwhelming. To, you know, we call this amygdala hijack. It hijacks our amygdala. We can't think straight. Oh, we need sometimes to get with somebody who's kind of knows something. And it's going to be caring and objective and just throw all the junk out and say, let's look at this, you know, like 52 pickup when you're playing cards. And as you put it together, you come back and go, oh, I just needed somebody's perspective. That makes sense. I'm making a point here. The, the point I was talking about when we were talking about having the plan for life um, or for your goals for 24, I mean, 23, um, you can't do this by yourself. I was with a bunch of people, wonderful people in a think tank. I like to go to various conferences where I'm really stretched for my professional life and, you know, what to do differently and, you know, what's going on in the future with tech and, and culture and all that. And I'm with these really cool people in these discussion groups. And I was talking to people about, you know, what I learned about. I studied, you know, the, the neuropsych and what the Bible says and research says about the need for attachment. And somebody says, oh, I love all this stuff. Can I learn how to do this by myself? And I went, I can't. Ugh. There's some things we can do by ourselves. I mean, we can think, we can read, we can cogitate, we can experiment with things. But fundamentally, God has put us in a place of relationship. And that means somebody besides him and besides your spouse and besides your Labrador Retriever, Max, has got to be in your head and you and they, lit, they love you, and they care about you, and they know it all, those are the most successful, happy people in the world. So there's a limit to what you can do if you don't have somebody with you thinking through things and feeling through things and listening to you. So watch out for the, what we call self-sufficiency. Um, doesn't work. Okay. Uh, okay. Where are we? John, your next question is coming from a writer um, over on Instagram who sent you a message. Her name is Chandra, and she's from Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. She says, um, I recently saw your holiday tip videos um, over on your TikTok channel. And my concern and question is that the holidays are just a couple of weeks away. And I was listening to the, your last show before you took a little break about um, a couple whose entire family was coming in and that similar scenario is about to happen for me. And I have spoken with my husband about it a couple of times 
Uh, we've been in a tumultuous relationship for the last six months in counseling ourselves. And I have really asked him to consider not having the family come this year for Christmas because it's a lot of stress. There's 10 people in the house, more gift giving, more food to prepare. And he just doesn't seem like he is open to it at all. We are pretty much on the brink of divorce. And I would really like to not oh. see our family separated with our three little kids at the holidays. But I know that I just don't have the energy mentally, physically, emotionally to be able to handle this for the holidays. What is some type of uh, statement or um, declaration that I can make to him to to have him understand that this is an absolute deal breaker for me. I'm really sorry to hear this, Chandra. It sounds awful. Um, one, where we're going to start is with your marital counselor. I'm glad you've got one. I'm sorry it's so hard. I'm sorry you guys are on the break or on the brink, but that's the um, <clears throat> that's the context to have the conversation. I would suggest you have and. Um, one function or one role that um, marital counselors take is that they they never like say that one's totally right, one's totally wrong, unless it's really true. But most of the time it's like, okay, here's your part, here's your part, here's where you're screwed up, here's where you're screwed up, and you know, you try to solve it. But to bring it to him or her, I mean, say, okay, you and your husband show up and say, um, exactly what you told me. You know, we're on the brink. And uh, I'm not sure I can handle this. And is there any way, Sam, that you can see your way to saying no to your family? My, my concern is if you're on the brink of divorce and Sam still wants to have his family over, that would speak to me of enmeshment issues with his family. Like, why would you threaten your, your closest relationship because mom and dad and siblings and nieces and nephews are coming in? It feels like he hasn't done a lot of differentiating and separating from his family in healthy ways and still more kind of like emotionally attached to them. And I would ask the therapist, is that could that be a possibility? So that's one route. And I would take that the first route is, well, can we go with priorities here and can he make a stand for his marriage? I would also say, is there something I, Chandra, can do to make it easier for you? Can I promise something good in January? Maybe they come in January. Or I would say, can they come when we're more solid? Because you can't, you can't break you can't put so much pressure on a broken uh, vehicle called marriage until it breaks. You can't do that. So that when we're solid, I'd love to have everybody over. And is there some kind of like compromise he would do there? Um, that was one. I did one. I did two. Then if he says no to all the above, they're coming over and no, there's no way I want to wait till then because it's special to me and whatever. Then I would probably say, something on the order of in the therapy session. So it'll be moderated and modulated by the shrink. Um, I will be taking breaks during the time everybody's here. And so uh, maybe you can get people who cook or maybe order out to DoorDash and I may be taking the kids somewhere and coming back and I'll, I'll be here as much as I can. I, I think that if he won't budge at all, then you need to say, okay, if they're staying three days, I or I and the kids, you figure that out, can be here X amount of hours per day. Maybe they're so crazy you can only take them one hour a day. Then you can one hour a day. Then you get you go stay, hang out with your friend Susie and do whatever. But you say, I'll do what I can, but I can't do what I can't do. And you map out, here's where I'll be here. Here's where I'll be gone. I'm telling you that in advance so that I'm being as kind as I can to you. That's where I go with it. And the principle here, Chandra, is we love to the far to the to the extent that we can love, but if we love to the extent that we are damaged, that's a whole different thing. I don't see the kind of damage you would cause yourself by staying there and being a good trooper. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help the kids. It doesn't help Sam, and it doesn't help the family. I don't see the sacrifice doing anything for anybody. That's why I I'd, I'd handle it. So best of luck to you. That's a tough situation, but. Go, go those three in order. Don't do the third one until you try the first two. Hope that makes sense. Thanks, Sandra. Um, <clears throat> by the way, I didn't want to let you know um, that Christmas time and the holidays, not only are a psycho time, 
loving and fun and psycho, all that. But there are also times where people reflect about like the big picture. Where am I going in my life? I'm in my 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And where am I going? It's a good time to reflect on where you're going. And some people say it's a time for opportunity. I, I've reached a ceiling or in my profession, or I, I want to go to a second profession, third profession. But it's a good time to say, am I happy where I am and fulfilled and feel like I'm using my passions and my gifts? Or I want to go another way. Well, if you want to go another way, we have the best opportunity I can think of, which is uh, to get a degree, a graduate degree or a credential in some area that you love, which is the Townsend Institute for Leadership and Counseling at Concordia University, Irvine, California. You can get with us a master's in counseling or a PhD or a credential if you don't want to go to the master's, but or a bachelor. You can get a bachelor if you want. But if, if counseling, helping brokenness, helping broken hearts and lives and addictions and relationships, this may be the opportunity. Or you might want to be in coaching. You know, coaching is such a growing field. Everybody is, is loving having coaching and being a coach. You can get a credential or a master's in an executive coaching consulting program. Or you can get a credential or master's in organizational leadership if you want to organize, if you want to lead you know, your own entrepreneurial gig or something in a family family business or a corporate business or a ministry, uh, we provide that. And if you like this approach, this relational approach, which is relational plus strategic, you know, it's the people piece and the strategic piece, give us a call. Um, Stacey always has the information up when I when I say this, but um, we're moderately priced and now we've been around long enough. We have hundreds and hundreds of students and hundreds and hundreds of grads, but now we're, we're finding out about in our field research, they're getting great jobs. They're getting wonderful jobs. We had one tell me the other day, I'm a counselor in a Midwest counseling center. I graduated last year and um, my peers are asking me to supervise them because I'm getting really good training. So we know that the products are working for people. So show up, we'll have an information session in a few weeks where I'll show up and people around the world, we had it two nights ago, around the world, you know, potential students ask questions and because you got a lot of questions about money and time, what are you teaching, what are the opportunities? I, I do a, a talk and then you break into our counseling breakout room or our leadership breakout room or a coaching breakout room. And you, you talk to our top professors about this. And that's how you get to know the real information. So show up for it and sign up. Um, and we hope that your opportunity bears fruit. OK, Stacy. OK, John, your next one is coming from um, Joseph from South Carolina. He said, just called in, but realized that um, some people in his office are having a meeting right next to him. So he's having to write his question in. Well, Joseph, we call that adaptive behavior. Keep that job. <laughs> That's right. So um, Joseph from South Carolina says, I also, I heard your previous caller and I also have been following your medias over the last few months, um, if not years. But the ones that you did about Christmas are really helpful, especially with the holiday season coming right up. And you did one about not falling into the Hallmark movie trap. And he said, I'm not trying, he says, I'm not trying to say anything bad about Hallmark whatsoever. I do believe the, the movies and shows are just fine and great. But the problem is my wife has been watching them for years. She will absolutely kill herself to make our home, our yard, and everything so perfect to match those movies in, in so much to the point that she overspends at the holidays and puts us in a bind with our own gift giving for our family, our children, ourselves. What can I do to talk with her in a way that she won't feel threatened, but she'll know not everything has to look just like those television shows, and you can't have that kind of expectation. Um, I get it. It happens a lot. And as you're sort of surmising, Joseph, it's not Hallmark's fault. About their fault. I mean, they're making they're making experiences for people that are fine. And I watched the happy ending. I know what's going to happen, and I still cry. So I mean, it's just like the way it goes. That's not the problem. It's more of a um, it's more of a trigger to another problem. Uh, number one. I don't think we can salvage this year. My hunch is you're probably already past the point, and I'm sorry that you're you're likely to have financial problems from this. I just think you're too far down down the road on this. But but and the reason I say this is because people can't people who are caught up in that it's, it's called idealization. People who idealize 
the holidays or whatever with the fantasies of what life should be. Um, you can't, it's very hard to break that. We're in the middle of it because like the feelings are there, the, um, actually the neuro, the, the neuro, um, uh, uh, hormones and stuff, all those, those little, little widgets in their heads are activated. It's going to be hard for her to be rational. I would say kind of suck it up to now and get a, get a plan. But in January, when it's all over and, you know, you can be back to some kind of rational objectivity, I would have a talk with her. And first off, I want you, I would like for you to have the mentality that um, it's possible that your wife has what we would call um, some losses in her life that has not been addressed and grieved and um, resolved. Because a lot of people who have that anxious demand that it be all perfect, the higher, the, I use the word idealization, the higher the intensity of the idealization is also the depth of the losses that have not been addressed and forgiven and grieved properly. People that kind of let things go and say, yeah, childhood was great, but there are some really bad things in it too. And I've grieved those and I've healed from them. They don't live in an idealized world. They don't have to, but people that go to the level your wife does very, very, very often they're, and they're not doing this consciously. I would not, I mean, I would be glad to have your wife on the show. This is nothing that's like not known about, but you can, it's sort of like they are compensating so much by the right things, the right experiences, because were they not to do that, the risk would be to her that she would delve into, I don't know, a mom that was passive or a dad that was absent or, you know, a place where she had no voice or some kind of perfectionistic family that she just couldn't be a little girl and have her flaws and all that. And the terror of going back into those losses and what would it be like? Will I be sad? Will I be, will I fall apart? Will I get depressed? Is so strong, you must move that way. That's the thinking of the person that must idealize. So I would start with that and say, um, you know, I love you and I love what we do and how important it is that our family have a great Christmas. As you know, here's the numbers and I wanted to let you know that. And it's happened several years. And um, I want to go beyond just say and stop that, honey. I don't want to get to, maybe there's a why. I mean, if, I'm, if there's, if there's anything I'm doing, if I'm a Grinch, and I think that Christmas sucks. I'll stop being Jim Carrey and I'll be a nice guy about it. And I'll support you if I'm the problem. But at the same time, I think there's another piece to this. And I'm wondering if there's some something that you're trying to make up for in childhood or trying to do better or stay away from things that were kind of yucky. And can we talk about that? And if you hit that, a lot of people will go, yeah, it was awful. And I don't want to think about it. And you say, you don't have to think about it. I'm just saying I'm going to keep bringing that up when I see the tendency to overspend hit because I'm really concerned. And a lot of times if a person, um, you know, loves their family and all this and feels safe, they'll go through a period of coming to terms with the past. It's people that don't come to terms with the past because it was so heinous or so sad or so traumatic that tend to do all kinds of things. I mean, we talked about Hallmark addiction. There's also drug addiction. There's also you know, alcohol addiction, there's also food addiction, there's also sex addictions, work addictions. And so look at that. And I wish you, wish you well on that. Okay, John, um, I just wanted to let callers know if you're having a hard time calling in today, it looks like there is a platform issue. Continue trying your calls. Um, and if you have forgotten the number, I'll give that to you uh, one more time here. Uh, let's see. Let me get back to it real quick. Sorry. About is, it, is it our platform or the world's platform? Huh. It would be Zoom's platform. Okay. Um, the wor the, the uh, tech gremlin platform. So if you're tech gremlins. To, yes. If you're wanting to call in and speak with John, take down this number. 1-877-853-5257. 1-877-853-5257. And use meeting ID code when you call in. The meeting ID code is 876-5437-2012. 876-5437-2012. And then your next question comes from Susan. She says, hi, John, I'm actually in your um, leadership uh, program at the Townsend Institute. And I- Way to go, Susan. 
She says, I have a question um, about passive aggressiveness. I am having a difficult time learning what the difference between being passive aggressive and being a narcissist is, because it seems to me that the two of them kind of have some similarities that collide together. Can you give me a little bit of clarity on being what exactly passive aggressiveness is in a marital relationship? Well, there is some overlap, but they're mainly more different than they are similar, Susan. Um, Let me just kind of define the two, um, I call them stances that people take. Passive aggressive has to do when the person is afraid of their um, anger, of being direct, being confronting. That's the aggressive part, by the way. The word aggression is not a bad word. And so when people say he or she is an aggressive person, something like that that can mean they take charge, they take initiative, they take agency, they're aggressive. Aggressive doesn't have a moral valence to it. Now, there can be loving, aggressive people who just go for it and they're very caring and connection. And they're gonna be mean, aggressive people, right? But let's don't make aggressive the bad word. It's not a bad word. We need more, God's aggressive. You know, He's, he's loving, but aggressive. Point is, some people are afraid of that, of that capacity we all have to take initiative and to confront when we need to and solve problems. It's about being active. And so we call them aggressively conflicted. People that are aggressively conflicted are terrified of speaking up and being direct. And who knows, they may be afraid of being rejected or put down or abandoned or beat up or abused or withdrawn from or whatever. They have a conflict. They just can't say, I hate this and I like this. And I want to go to this restaurant. And this behavior is good. This behavior, they can't do it. So the way that they, that, they ex, that they express their natural God-given aggression is in sneaky ways. So they'll do little side comments and little uh, rolling of the eyes and subtle things. And it drives, drives people crazy and it makes people matter than if they would just be direct about it, but they can't stop it because they haven't dealt with this. So the passive aggressive person is a person that, that can't be angry directly or confront directly, but they are subtle, sarcastic, drop hints, or they, you know, burn the dinner or bring the, bring the, um, the lawn, the, the, the cleaning home an hour late and, and forget things they shouldn't forget. Okay. Hope we got that straight. Narcissism is a stance of having a grandiose sense of oneself and a lack of empathy for others. A grandiose sense of of oneself where they see themselves as more special than other people should be, and they want to be treated as special because either somebody told them they're special or nobody ever told them they were loved. There's two causes, but it's bigger than life. And also the energy they sent, they, they put into creating this, they're smarter, prettier, stronger, more, um, more successful, they've got the bigger boat, the best kids or whatever, the energy they spend in that takes away from the, the energy they need to spend in empathy for others and, and entering their world. They want people to enter their world, but they have a hard time entering the other person's world. It's like, um, you know, you can tell at a cocktail party when you're speaking to a narcissist, very easy to, to, to determine it because at the party, a narcissist, um, will say, look, let's stop talking about me today. Let's talk about what you think about me today. Okay. So (laughs) the point is though, one's grandiose lack of empathy. One is gets mad, but can't do anything about it. So sneaky. So they're very different stances. I guess the only interaction between the two, Susan, would be they drive people crazy, but from two different reasons. Hope that helps. And Glad you're in the leadership program, and I hope you're going to be a wonderful leader one day. We need more leaders out there changing the world. Okay, John, your next question comes from Kelly, and she's over on your Twitter channel. And she says, um, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a post that you made about um, boundaries, basically saying that you do not owe someone an explanation for why you will not um, take responsibility for something that isn't your responsibility. Um, she has let me, well, let me, so I said, you don't owe someone explanation for not doing something that you don't think is your responsibility. 
Is that what yeah. she's, are you, she's saying? Yes. Is Kelly, is Kelly a guy or a gal or what? Kelly is a gal and she okay. is from Tennessee. Um, okay. she, and your quote exactly was, you owe no one an explanation about why you will not do something that is not your responsibility. Okay. And she What's said, the question? This, this tends to come at me in my personal life and my professional life. And it seems that if I say no to someone about something or even the statement which I did learn from you on a previous show, that doesn't work for that me. That doesn't work for me, the, the big five words. Yes. She says, it seems that when I say those things or if I say no, I get the deer in the headlights look or someone combats me and comes back to me as to why I do need to take this on. What are some things that I can say in response to when they throw it back on me? Um, Kelly, I think I screwed up on that one. And that doesn't make sense to me why I would say that. Let me tell you what I'm thinking. Um, if there's a person you've told several times, you know, I can't do it. And I can't do it because I've got to pick my kids up from school. or I can't do it because I don't have the time or the money or whatever. And you've really explained it. And they say again, why can't you? Why can't you? Why can't you? Like, like a three-year-old would. There's a point. After, I'm a kind of a three guy. After a two or three explanation you got to say look i just said no but i think the reason i'm questioning what i why i said what i said it doesn't make sense to me and that john would say that this john is saying that that john doesn't know what he's talking about right now me is sure if somebody says hey can you go to the show with us well you say let's talk about an obligation not something fun because you said it's when you don't think you're responsible somebody says can you take on this extra project for me why not just say, no, I can't because I don't have the bandwidth. I mean, that's just kind. Now, if they say, why, why, why? And you've got to, you got to, you got to. Finally, you say, look, I, sometimes I tell people, sometimes you have to say, this really isn't a conversation. This is an announcement because you are not listening to me. So, no, this, that is not a universal statement of never, never explain. But stop explaining when you've, over, when you've explained, explained, and they just, they're a boundary buster and they don't want to get it. So, absolutely. I don't have time or... Uh, no, I, I don't really see that quite as my responsibility, and I can talk to you about that, but that's how I'd handle it. Wait till they start busting the boundaries and just say, no, you're not getting it. Hope that helps. Okay, John, your next question comes from Tiffany. She said, I've been calling in, but I am getting like a scratchy um, phone line. So I'm just going to write you my question this time and I'll try and call next week. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, we will be here the next two weeks in a row. So be sure to save the call in information. If you weren't able to get with John today, you can call back next week. Uh, Tiffany says, I have been following your relational nutrients videos that you've been putting out. These are super helpful to me. I did not know about this. So thank you. I've shared that link of relational nutrients to everyone in my friend group and people are loving it. So yeah, we, we've trademarked that term. So feel free to use it now. And she says, um, the one that I have the question about is um, relational nutrients uh, in quadrant four, you talked about with structure um, mm -hmm. and a call to action with people. And she said, I'm having a difficult time in my life with structure. I'm on a ministry team at my church. I'm also in school. I have three children. My husband and I have been married 15 years and I also have a full-time job. My life is over brimming um, to say the least. And I don't feel like I have any structure. I feel like I move through my days from activity to activity responsibility to responsibility, and there is zero time to even sit down and create the structure. Could it be that it is time for me to let something go in my life? Or how can I just create some space to get a better structured plan for my life and find someone that I can ask them to give me that call to action? Great question, Tiffany. And it, it reminds me a little bit of the earlier call. Um, where she said something fairly similar. There's some differences, but yeah, really good, really good question. Um, when people say, I don't have enough structure, there are, there are, there are, there's not an infinite number of, excuse me, of solutions to that. There's a finite number. One is that I'm not, it's a matter of organization. And or the other is there's just too much. 
those are kind of the solution or, or I've got some emotional problem because I'm depressed or I'm got an awful thing that's sucking on my life out. I guess that's the third one is personal issues. She just let's, tied back to you and said, yes, I feel like my life is completely out of control. Okay. I'm here. I'm not here in the, I'm depressed. I'm, I've got PTSD. I'm not hearing that. So I'm going to put that on the side, Tiffany. I mean, uh, yeah, Tiffany. And I'm going to go with the other two. When people say, I feel like my life is out of control, it's either that there's literally, there's literally too much stuff, the 10 pounds of potatoes, the five pound bag, and something's got to go, or it's a matter of not being organized. Now, I always tell people when I get this question, you know, I'm working with a client, let's go with the second one first. Let's go with, maybe you don't have to prune anything back. Maybe it's just not, you know how they say work smarter and not harder. And so it's just a matter of, you know, sitting down with or without I like to sit down by myself first and then bring somebody in later. I like to get out of my own head, get your whiteboard or iPad or whatever, and put in your, and, and just, I think it's really so important to look at a month of calendar. Just take your last 30 days, then the month of November, for example. December is not, it's kind of an exception because it's too crazy, but a month of November. Or October 15th and November 15th, then you miss Thanksgiving. And you look at everything and then you kind of color code what is absolutely essential that I've got to do? Like your kids are absolutely essential, right? Your, your self-care, your spiritual life are absolutely essential. Your marriage is absolutely essential. But then there's some things that aren't, like how much you're working. Maybe there's some play there or how much you're spending off time or whatever and, um, and all this. So you kind of color code the, the essentials from the would-be nices. And sometimes that'll solve it because people go, oh, I got some would be nices and they can go away for the season of life. And that's less of whatever. But once you've done that, these are the prioritized and all the prioritizing is clear. You're clear in your one. In other words, everything is essential that you're on survival mode. There's nothing you can prune back. And by the way, Tiffany, make sure you have vetted that with somebody else. Because you're probably a perfectionist. I think you said that you said you're perfectionist. Well, perfectionist, everything's essential. It means you got this judge in your head that's telling you that Tiffany's got to do it all and make straight A's and everything. And you're going to have to get somebody out of your head to say, talk to me about your priorities. Now, if it's a serious perfectionist, your friends and your, your husband can't help. You're going to have to see a therapist. But if you're a mild, a mild perfectionist, then They'll go, look, seriously, you can do without this. And, and our kids don't have to be perfect all the time and all that. And get somebody that you trust that's balanced, that can solve it. But let's, I like to give people the, the, the kind of a happy answer and then the if it goes bad answer. And then say, you've done it all. And then what do I prune back? Now, since you are a card-carrying perfectionist, and I understand I've got some of that, the, the, the deeper... The deeper resolution of perfectionism is grief and acceptance. Perfectionists have a hard time with accepting their limitations, and they generally come from some kind of environment, relational environment, when somebody expected way too much of that them or moved the goalpost. And so you know, make a B and you're supposed to get an A and you made an A. Why didn't you make an A plus? And that's just impossible. And people grow up as card carrying perfectionists. And so um, that means there's going to have to be some sadness of I can't do it and you know disappoint that person in your head mom dad coach teacher pastor whoever that has told you that let go of that separate from them in your head and that can be done with a, a loving person or a good therapist and then once you agree that then you kind of go oh here's the here's the key word for the perfectionist ready good enough Tiffany's good enough her kids sometimes have snot on their nose, but they're great kids and she's good enough. Sometimes she doesn't, she's not always perfect in how she works in her job and all this. And sometimes she's a little sloppy and sometimes the house isn't great. And sometimes she's not the number one employee at the business, but she's good enough and everybody likes her. And when you can go to good enough, that can transform it. The second mantra that a perfection need, perfectionist needs besides good enough is this. I need to stop worrying about being perfect. I need to worry more about being loved for myself. I need to stop worrying about being perfect for everybody. I need to worry more about being loved for myself because people who are loved, who feel accepted even in their frailties and even their mistakes and their warts and blemishes, 
and their failures, people that feel loved there and they don't feel judged and they don't feel condemned, they become good enough. They know that at the end of the day, life isn't about doing everything perfectly and they relax because the love is so great. That's where I go, Tiffany. Good luck with it. That's excellent advice, John. It seems a lot of people, you have a lot of people really chiming in on the holiday, the um, three video series you shared about the holidays and lots of writings on that. Several people are wanting to call in, but saying they'll give you a, a shout back next week. Seems like this time of year is just really difficult for people. Um, unfortunately, it is. And I have found it so helpful to make sure there's at least one person besides your spouse and God and your Labrador Retriever Max that you can be real with and just talk about how disappointing and sad your Christmas is. It's a weird thing about the way God created created the brain. We think if I do that, I'll hate it more. I'll be depressed. No, you don't. You'll feel better. And why do you feel better talking about yucky, sucky stuff to somebody who's warm and accepting? Because you're not alone in the negative. See, the goal is not to think positively all the time. Those people are crazy. You, th you need somebody to feel negative with and kind of complain about things. And they go, me too. I got it. I'm with you. We call that getting in the well, you know, getting the well of negativity and pain. And it makes you feel positive. Why? Because I'm not all by myself in the black hole of my head trying to feel positive. I got somebody who says, it's okay to be negative. I get that way too. I'm not by myself. Somebody's in the room in my head that says, it's okay. And that creates positivity. Not crazy positivity. Not woohoo, everything's great positivity. Those people, they're, they're hard to have lunch with. But kind of a healthy positivity where you say, yeah, there are negatives. But overall, I've got so many blessings. So find that person, that accepting warm person that you can say, it's really sucks right now, but they love you and you love them. That's where I go. So I'm so glad we're going to be next, back next week and um, hope the, that whatever happened with the tech gremlins, they won't be there and we'll talk to you guys and hope we can solve some problems. So have a good week until then. <laughs>